Hello everyone. As part of our Saving Lives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Capnography, It's More Than Ventilation. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Christine Lux, who is our moderator today. Christine is a clinical educational specialist at Overlake Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. She facilitates patient care services and hospital-wide orientation for nurses. She is a content expert for hospital-wide cardiac policies and procedures. And prior to Overlake, she was a cardiology clinical nurse specialist at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. And as well, she was also a co-chair of the Code Blue Committee. In addition to that, Christine has facilitated and developed the educational plan for the development of the Surgical Airway Code. Christine, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? I am, Emily. Thank you for your very kind introduction. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. The title of today's webinar is Capnography. It is more than ventilation. Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague of mine, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. About 15 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a change that spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on the topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchik Consulting and Education. Nicole has disclosed the following affiliation. She's on the Speakers Bureau for Physio Control Striker, Medtronic, and Malik Rod. She is a consultant for Physio Control and Striker. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. As you can see, the accreditation statement is disclosed on the slide. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. Support for this educational activity is provided by Physio Control. It is now time to hand over this webinar to our expert, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole, are you ready? I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. Coming to you live from rainy, dreary Seattle. So anyway, um, but really excited. There's There were lots of people signed up for today's session, so I'm really excited. Uh, today's uh, topic, we're going to be speaking on capnography, and one of my sayings is that it always tells you more than just ventilation. So, um, so objectives for the day, we're going to talk about normal and abnormal uh, ventilation perfusion or VQ relationships. We're going to talk about how capnography can be used as an indicator of fluid responsiveness, and then I am going to talk about how you can integrate capnography into your resuscitation program. So, um, so we're going to start out with the polling questions. So, Emily, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, audience, this is what I want to know from you guys. So all of you um, can use do polling this morning. And what I want to know is, what is your comfort level with capnography? But I want to know, do you feel like a pro and you can teach this? Um, do you have some understanding of the VQ relationship? And um, if you uh, haven't used vet capnography much, you can indicate that. So so we'd love to know what your comfort level is with capnography. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close, close the poll, and now I'm going to share these results with you. Oh, okay. All right, so I love it. Okay, so a few people are feeling like they're, they understand, have a good understanding of capnography. Okay, so I, Emily, I think I'm ready to totally get started here. Okay, so a couple things um, about uh, capnography is um, one of the things I always want nurses and RTs, physicians, um, whoever is out there, what I want you to understand is that capnography measures a few different things. So first of all, it measures ventilation. So in normal VQ relationships, it measures how well um, the body is exhaling CO2. Um, in other situations, it can tell you about perfusion or how effectively the body is, is transporting carbon dioxide. And then finally, a lot of dietitians might actually use um, some form of capnography to figure out kind of the nutritional status of patients and how the body is producing CO2. So kind of more as a marker of metabolism. 
So those would be the three ways. Now there's some terms I want to get everyone kind of clear with. So the term capnometry means that you're basically getting, getting a numeric number of your end tidal CO2. Um, a capnogram is, is literally just the waveform, but what most people do is they combine the two of um, getting a, an actual value of your end tidal CO2 with the waveform, and that is what we term as capnography. So you might hear it called end tidal CO2, you might hear it called waveform catnography, continuous waveform catnography, they're all the same thing. And so, um, but the bottom line is you should be looking at a waveform with a numeric number. Um, so a couple things to get really straight. Um, you know, as we get started here. So first of all, there is what you exhale, and there's there's the com carbon dioxide that you exhale, and a normal um, uh, end tidal CO2 is 35 to 45. Then there's the amount of carbon dioxide that we can measure in the blood, and again, a normal is about 35 to 45. The relationship between um, what you exhale and what you measure in the blood is what we call the VQ relationship, or the ventilation perfusion relationship. And in general, what you um, measure on exhalation and what you measure in the blood should be less than five points from each other. Now, uh, uh, people who are really up on their physiology might be more of a purist and say, oh, we must measure the VQ ratio. So the VQ ratio is a little bit different. So um, that's taking in consideration ventilation or the amount of air reaching the alveoli. And a normal minute ventilation is about four liters a minute. Um, it takes into consideration perfusion, so a normal cardiac, out, cardiac output is about 5 liters a minute. And when you look at those in relationship, um, your ideal VQ ratio should be about 0.8. Um, so again, that would be 4 liters per minute, or your ventilation divided by your perfusion, which averages about 5 liters per minute. And the problem clinically is that this is kind of challenging to measure, and so, um, so we don't measure a pure VQ ratio, what we'll do is we'll use our end tidal CO2 and then what we measure in the blood um, as kind of a surrogate to understand the ventilation perfusion relationship. And so a lot of times, um, and I actually just had a nurse yesterday I was chatting with who was saying she had a patient who um, they were um, was on a ventilator and they were measuring end tidal CO2 and she said the end tidal CO2 was a lot lower than the PaCO2. And so I said, oh, okay, great, tell me more. Because I've heard a lot of people say that, oh, I don't believe the end-tidal CO2, it's not accurate. And, and I completely disagree with that. End-tidal CO2 is very accurate. Um, but what you have to know and what you have to understand is what is the VQ relationship in these patients. So, for example, if I've got a normal cardiac output and I don't have any lung issues, my end-tidal CO2 and my... Um, PaCO2 should be, like I said, less than five points from each other. But some patients can get either, um, can get VQ mismatch. The two most common causes of VQ mismatch are shunting and dead space. So shunting, um, the different reasons patients would shunt, so that's where you get perfusion, but you have a decrease in ventilation. Um, pulmonary edema would cause a pulmonary shunt. Uh, pneumonia, pulmonary contusions. Now on the other hand, we can get alveolar dead space. So that's where you've got ventilation, but you have a decrease in perfusion. And prime examples of that would be like a pulmonary embolism, um, ARDS, or pulmonary hypertension. So, um, so the thing you have to understand is if your PaCO2 and your end tidal CO2 aren't exactly the same, there's probably a reason why. Um, the other reason that I didn't talk about is um, related to cardiac output. So if your cardiac output is really dropping, your end tidal CO2 will drop in addition. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna actually going to go through some different case scenarios and talk about um, why the VQ relationship may not be quite spot on. So, so when should we use capnography? So I want you guys to think about your own clinical situations. And so when when should you use catnography? Well, some kind of basics. Um, it is the gold standard for endotracheal tube placement. So a lot of nurses and RTs, when I ask this question, they'll say, oh, the chest x-ray, that's how we verify endotracheal tube placement. But actually, that's not the right answer. Um, end tidal CO2 is the way you verify endotracheal tube placement. So what you're assessing is a placement in the lungs versus the gut. Where does CO2 live? In the lungs, not the gut. And so um, you know that if you have, um, what we'll do is we'll either usually put a little CO2 detector or we'll connect the patient to end tidal CO2 when we intubate. And if you've got any CO2, you're in the lungs. Now, a chest X-ray is important. You have to get a chest X-ray. But what it's going to tell you is how high or how low your endotracheal tube is. And so it's literally for positioning where end tidal CO2 will tell you if you're in the lungs versus the gut. 
So some other areas where we use end tidal CO2. Anytime you're doing procedural moderate to deep sedation, it is the it is a mandate that you use end tidal CO2. Um, new generation PCA pumps actually have end tidal CO2 um, because again I'm going to talk about why SpO2 has got a lot of limitations, but um, other ways we can use it: identifying septic patients. Um, uh, identifying if patients going to be a fluid responder and then of course cardiac arrest I'm going to talk about each of these scenarios okay so a couple things um, end tidal CO2 and SpO2 are really really different measurements from each other and it's it, one of the things that drives me nuts is that you know we rely too much on SpO2 so you really need to understand the difference so capnography tells you how a patient's ventilating so it really tells you you know if CO2 is building up or if the patient's blowing off CO2 whereas SpO2 literally just tells you you know what percentage or how saturated is the blood with oxygen and so it does not tell you how a patient's ventilating and when you think about it you know when does SPO2 identify that you've got a patient in trouble and I just kind of jokingly say this I say it with a little scar sarcasm but I actually kind of mean it you know SPO2 tells you a patient's in trouble when they're about dead when they're in, in severe severe distress it, it is not an early indicator capnography is a very very early indicator in a study from over 10 years ago um, was able to show that patients where capnography was used they were 28 times more likely likely to be detected with capnography versus SpO2 and so you know when you look at the reasons that patients have um, compromise um, on acute care units or reasons why a rapid response or met teams are activated acute respiratory compromise is the most common reason and one thing I truly believe is just we're not using the right technology to identify these patients in um, on acute care areas so this is just a picture kind of showing that now new generation PCA pumps actually have capnography you know built into them I mean why well I mean you think about the medications we give I don't, I don't know I feel like a lot of um, hospitals and a lot of nurses I talk to and mine hospital included is that we're we're, lying, we're going more toward Dilaudid to use for pain medication and you know if you kind of think about Dilaudid is about seven to eight times the strength of morphine it is a very potent opioid and it causes respiratory depression and so we really need to something that's going to be an early indicator to tell us if patients are in trouble and that would be capnography so the American Society of Anesthesiologists since 2010 have made it a national mandate and a standard to monitor end tidal CO2 for any patient receive, receiving moderate to deep sedation when they're not intubated. So if you're giving or providing sedation and analgesic for procedures, you should be using end tidal CO2 in addition to SpO2. So, um, why capnography? So this is an interesting story. It's all about the patients, right? It's all about patient safety. So so th this is a gal named Amanda who is 18 years old so she was admitted um, to a hospital back in 2010 with severe pain from um, and, um, she had a strep throat infection and had severe pain and she was on an acute care unit and they were using SPO2 and just kind of routine vital signs uh, to monitor you know her um, the, uh, Amanda and so she was admitted on a Thursday um, and they were using oral analgesics but that didn't wasn't quite cutting the pain so um, on the next day on Friday they put her on a PCA pump with opioids and the way they were monitoring her was shoot they were just spot checking oximetry and checking vital signs and if you think about you know most 18 year olds are opioid naive they've never received opioids and so they're gonna be far more sensitive and unfortunately the next day she was found unresponsive they had to call a cardiac arrest or a code blue and uh, tried to resuscitate her and they were unsuccessful and so it's cases like this where you really have to ask you know are we using the right technology to monitor patients especially on acute care areas so anytime you're combining analgesia with sedation you should be monitoring end tidal co2 and again it tells you how your patients ventilating so it's going to be a very very early indicator of um, respiratory failure and respiratory compromise the only the one drawback though that I would say about using capnography is the the one one main concern I would have is you know that it is sensitive so it is going to tell you if a patient's not ventilating appropriately and one of the things I worry about is, um, is just alarm fatigue you know because if a patient dozes off to sleep their end tidal CO2 probably you know will go up 
but um, so that's kind of the slippery slope that we play with with end tidal CO2 is just um, you know alarms and, and just kind of creating this whole idea of alarm fatigue so so there's lots of other reasons we can use end tidal CO2 and I think a lot of um, emergency departments are using it but you know who's a big user of end tidal CO2 is EMS so our EMS agencies have they've really have kind of had a handle on capnography for a number of years but if you've got someone who's had an alcohol intoxication or drug ingestion that's causing respiratory compromise this will be a great patient to um, use for standard monitoring uh, metabolic emergencies so for DKA a lot of facilities will use end tidal CO2 to identify um, you know, for getting close to closing the gap and shutting down ketosis in DKA patients. Um, sepsis, I'm actually talking about specific um, cases in sepsis where you can use end tidal CO2. Um, congestive heart failure, so a lot of times these patients will present and they're very short of breath and uh, they might be, you know, blowing off CO2 because they're air hungry, but in cases where they get tired, this is where end tidal CO2 is really helpful and um, watching for trends and an increase in their end tidal CO2. Um, pulmonary embolism, and tidal CO2 can be very helpful and actually I'm going to go over a very specific case where uh, and show how you can use end tidal CO2 so we can use capnography with an endotracheal tube so I've got a, a picture um, here of a patient who um, basically we've connected the um, adapter on the end of the endotracheal tube um, that uh, measures um, end tidal CO2 you can use it with trached patients you can use it with a bag valve mask so I put a picture here of a bag valve mask and what you can do is connect the adapter in between the BVM or bag valve mask and the AMBU bag and then there are cannula devices that you can use that measure end tidal CO2 so there's lots of different ways we can do it so most um, facilities are using um, microstream technology or mainstream um, kind of methods of um, kind of capturing CO2 and so the great thing about it is you get a nice waveform with it it's very accurate in measuring respiratory rates um, of your patient and um, it's very helpful especially in neonates because they uh, you know neonates breathe really fast and um, it, it accurately picks up all of those uh, respirations um, from the little baby so here's actually a picture of the um, kind of the uh, adapter that you can use with with uh, end tidal CO2 so I think understanding the waveform is super helpful so this is a typical this is a drawing of an end tidal CO2 waveform and so you can kind of see from point A to B what's happening here is this is your baseline so no CO2 is being exhaled during that point B to C shows kind of um, a big rise in your CO2 this is early exhalation so that's when patients clear their dead space at the point um, D D is where we actually capture the end tidal CO2 so the point from C to D is what we call the alveolar plateau and this is when alveolar gas exchange is taking place um, the, at D again that's where um, end tidal CO2 is actually measured and then from point D to E this is when inspiration um, occurs and there is a huge rapid decrease in CO2 so that's what a normal end tidal CO2 waveform looks like so understanding what normal looks like can help you identify issues when the waveform doesn't look normal so one of the things you can see here is you can kind of see an upward uh, uh, kind of trend in the waveform this can be caused from a number of different things um, this could be caused from a partial airway obstruction um, if your patients hypoventilating um, if they suddenly drop their um, I'm sorry if they suddenly increase their blood pressure Pressure, you might see an increased trend um, in your end tidal CO2 waveform so so usually that's not as big of a deal um, one of the ways I like using end tidal CO2 is when patients are admitted with bronchospasm so your COPD ears and your asthmatics and what a lot of times because they've got such airway um, kind of restriction you'll get like almost like a shark fin on their waveform and as you um, you know get your steroids started and, and get um, beta 2 agonism like albuterol um, uh, if, you know we give uh, nebulizers what you'll see is the um, the waveform will become less of a shark fin pattern and we'll, um, they'll actually have a kind of a level out in the plateau and so that's a sign that you've uh, really uh, dealt with and decreased the bronchospasm um, another thing you might see in severe asthmatics is actually a downward slope um, of the waveform and that we'll see usually with severe asthmatics so um, then another um, thing that kind of one of the things that I 
think when I see a waveform like this, where you've kind of got a baseline that's uh, that's rising and it's not coming back to what should be the baseline, is I always think that we probably need to calibrate the device. It's usually a device issue um, that maybe we need, we've got a contaminated sensor or we need to actually calibrate the device itself. So anyway, so that's kind of a summary of what uh, the waveforms look like. And then one of the great things is if you've got a patient who's intubated, and you're ever transporting them, or taking them to CT or cath lab, or or maybe um, you know you just just for general monitoring, you will know right away if they dislodge or if they um, extubate themselves because you will get a flat line on your um, end tidal CO2 and it will alarm right away. And so if you've got endotracheal tube dislodgement, which can occur during transports, your end tidal CO2 will give you um, a cue to that. SpO2 will not um, from an early standpoint. So. All right, so what I want to do this morning is I would love to torture you guys with some data. So you guys ready? Let's let's do a quick stats lesson here. So, so this is this might look kind of a, like a busy slide, but um, one of the things we do when we're trying to say, you know, how good is this technology we're using? So how accurate is end tidal CO2, or how accurate is any technology used? So in a lot of studies that are done to validate technology, what they'll do is they want to figure out how sensitive is this technology to tell me what I want it to tell me, and then how specific is it to get the answer right. And so um, one of the things they'll do is um, uh, plot what's called a receiver operator curve. And so this um, graph to the left is what we call a receiver operator curve. And then what we do is we plot sensitivity against specificity to tell us how accurate these parameters might be in predicting what we want it to predict. So this is a study that's actually kind of, um, it's an older study by Dr. Machard, um, uh, back from 2000, and um, and it was what he was trying to, to the, the research question he was asking is how well do different hemodynamic parameters predict fluid responsiveness, especially like in a patient who's got sepsis, so right, because in sepsis you want to know, you know, does my patient or are they going to respond to fluids, and so when you look at research and you see that they've plotted this, an area under the curve or an AUC of one means it's a perfect predictor that every time it's going to tell you what you want it to tell you. Um, if they scores, if it scores a 0.9 to a 0.99, that means it's excellent technology. A point 0.8 to a 0.9 means it's good. A 0.7 to a 0.8 means it's fair. And then anything below a 0.7, you kind of have to wonder if we should be using it, um, you know, in uh, the clinical setting because it's not very predictive. So, for example, for years and years and years and years, we have used CVP, the central venous pressure, or right atrial pressure, to predict or decide if a patient needs fluid in the setting of sepsis. Well, interestingly, when um, Dr. Machard published this study, what he found was that the CVP, or central venous pressure, had an area under the curve of 0.56 to predict fluid responsiveness. So it was a complete fail. And so, um, so you know, I always have questioned, like, for years and years and years, why do we use CVP to decide if patients who are septic need fluid, um, you know, when it's it's a very poor predictor. It's it's, it's a fail, actually. So it's literally as good as flipping a coin. And so um, CVP is a huge fail. So why do people still measure it in, to decide if your patient needs fluid? So what I want to do is kind of take it, you know, so it's, it's as good as this. I don't know if you guys remember the Super Bowl from a number of years ago um, when Joe Namath, who I absolutely love and adore, came out in his fur coat and he flipped the coin um, to decide who kicks first. So so if, it, if something has an area under the curve of, you know, about, uh, you know, anywhere around 0.5, then that means it's as good as or as accurate as flipping a coin. So we really shouldn't be using something that's as good as flipping a coin to make clinical decisions. And so this was a really interesting study that was published last year. I love this study. So what they did is they this was done in the emergency department department in the um kind of in the uh, uh, triage area and if patients had at least two SERS criteria so you know SERS systemic inflammatory response syndrome so like a faster heart rate a respiratory rate that's fast um, a white count that's either elevated or decreased or a temperature that's high or low so if they had at least two SERS criteria plus a suspicion of infection they connected the patient to end tidal CO2 if the end tidal CO2 was less than 25 they activated a sepsis alert and get this okay so now I want you to think about this if your end tidal is less than 25 how are you breathing are you breathing fast or slow you're breathing fast, right? You're blowing off your CO2 because the normal end tidal is 35 to 45. So what this study was able to show is that using end tidal CO2 with at least two SIRS and a sus suspicion of infection, um, 
had an accuracy or an area under the curve of 0.99 in identifying sepsis. So this was kind of actually a little bit mind-blowing to me, and this is really cheap and really easy um, thing to do in triage to use with SIRS criteria and just a suspicion of infection. So, so quite fascinating. So the whole idea is that if um, if we are breathing fast, so as our respiratory rate increases, we're going to exhale more CO2 and our end tidal CO2 is going to drop. Whereas if we're hypoventilating, like let's say maybe I'm on a lot of PCA and I'm kind of gorked out, um, I might not breathe as uh, effectively and my CO2 is going to rise and I'm going to retain CO2. So that's just some kind of basic ideas behind end tidal CO2. Now, one of the things in, in sepsis that is really important um, when you look at the things that are most predictive um, in sepsis, um, when, you, when you're kind of looking at search criteria, is actually the respiratory rate. But um, the respiratory rate is one of the most sensitive indicators to tell you your patient's getting sick. But here's the problem. In hospitals, how do we measure respiratory rate? And the answer is we don't. We make it up all the time. We make it up. And, and you know, a lot of you are probably rolling your eyes out out there at me right now. But uh, but we do. We make it up. And I always we jokingly say, are you a 16 hospital? Are you an 18 hospital? Or are you a, a respiratory rate of 20 hospital? So where are you? You're probably somewhere in there. But um, but traditionally, in general, what we've done is you know we've manually we say that we manually count respirations, which I think for the most part we don't. I think we measure we manually measure respiratory rate uh, when we're concerned about patients. Um, but we know that. That we're really inaccurate that. Um, you can use your ECG to um, the impedance on your ECG electrodes to measure respiratory rate, but again, it's not very effective. Um, end tidal CO2 is going to be one of the most accurate ways of measuring the respiratory rate unless you actually do uh, stand there and count it. But um, but the great thing about using end tidal CO2 is that you know you do get a very accurate respiratory rate. So here's our first case. So I came on shift. Um, this is a few months ago to a patient who was septic. She was on a ventilator. And um, she'd already gotten about six liters of fluid, so her x-ray was looking somewhat like she had ARDS. And so I come on shift, and her um, blood pressure is 89 over 42. So 89 over 42, and she's got a map of 61. So do I need to do something? And the answer is yes, I need to do something. So this is a 63-year-old who's got sepsis. She's intubated. She's hypotensive. Um, her blood pressure is 89, 42 with a map of 61. So, so she's pretty much breathing with the ventilator. So I'm kind of looking at her, and I'm trying to decide, does she need fluid? You know, do I give this woman fluid? She has a central line in place. I hook up the CVP only because we're doing a study for no other reason because the CVP of 10 does not really tell me anything. It really gives me no guidance as to what I should do. So what I ended up doing, so I'm trying to decide, fluid pressors, fluid pressors, like how do I treat this woman's blood pressure of 89 over 42? Do I give her more fluid knowing that she's already somewhat, you know, kind of borderline ARDS, knowing that I could make it her pulmonary status worse? if she's not truly a responder, or do I give her a presser, um, like norepinephrine that was commonly given in sepsis. So what I did was called the passive leg raise. So I hooked her up to capnography, so I put on um, capnography. Now, um, you can either do it with a cannula or you can hook it up to the end of the endotracheal tube. And with her head of the bed up, feet flat, I got a baseline um, and tidal CO2. Then what I did was I dropped her head and I lifted her legs and by doing that what you're doing is you're taking the blood volume in the legs and you're pushing it back toward the heart. So you're pushing it back toward the heart and basically you're giving the patient their own physiologic fluid bolus. And this is what I found. So check this out. Well a couple things I should mention first is who would you not want to do a passive leg raise technique in. Um, it's a test that we do just to kind of identify patients or fluid responders. So some obvious ones would be if they've got an amputated leg, this is not the test for them. Um, but if they've got com um, TED hose on, you want to take those off first. If they've got a DVT in their lower extremity, this is not the test for them. Um, if they've got head trauma, ICP issues, this would not be the test for them. Or if they've got intra-abdominal hypertension or ascites, this is probably not the best test to do. But she didn't have any of these contraindications. So what I did was with her head of the bed up, I got a baseline catenography reading. So her baseline was 29. So what do you guys think about a 29? 29 is pretty low, and then I looked at her, and she was breathing with the vent. So it's not like she was hyperventilating and blowing off CO2. She just had a low CO2, and my suspicion was that her CO2 was low because her cardiac output was low, because her pressure was low, and she probably needed fluid. So what I did then was I lifted her legs, so I 
did a passive leg raise and for about one minute and what I very quickly saw was that her end tidal CO2 went to 36. So within one minute, her end tidal went from 29 to 36. So now I can make an educated decision and say with very, very, uh, with a huge amount of certainty, she definitely needs fluids. And so that's what I did was I gave her fluid. And so um, it, what the studies have shown is if your end tidal CO2 goes up by 5% with a passive leg raise, that's an indicator that they will be a fluid responder. If it doesn't go up by 5%, then you probably should treat the hypotension with fluid. And so that's what I did. So this is just kind of a diagram showing when you lift the legs, you're giving the patient a physiologic fluid bolus, and um, and it's, it's re really with their own blood volume. And if their end tidal goes up by at least 5%, that's an indicator they likely will be a fluid responder. So, so with all certainty, I gave her fluid. So how accurate is end tidal in predicting fluid responsiveness? Well, the study done by Dr. Monet um, compared arterial blood pressure with end tidal CO2 and actually measuring the cardiac index. And what he was able to show in his study, so he calculated area under the curve. So you guys ready for this? So what's a good area under the curve? One more time. Perfect is a 1. Excellent technology would be a 0.9 to a 0.99. Um, good would be 0.8 to 0.89. Fair would be 0.7 to 0.79, and then anything below 0.7, you got to ask if we should be using it. So here we go. So her, um, remember, um, CVP was as good as flipping a coin. So any area under the curve of about 0.5 is as good of, as a coin flip. So what he was able to show is measuring blood pressure to decide whether your patient needs fluid. The area under the curve was a 0.65. So we shouldn't be using blood pressure to decide if patients need fluid. The end tidal CO2 had a predictability of 0.93, which is excellent. And then the, probably the most accurate would be a changes in your your cardiac index or stroke volume, which had an area under the curve of 0.98. So we really probably should not be using blood pressure to decide if patients need fluid. We should be something using something more like, um, uh, you know, a stroke volume measure, cardiac output measure, or may possibly end tidal CO2. Okay. So now. In cardiac arrest, the American Heart Association has given, um, has recommended using end tidal CO2 to use during arrest. So you should absolutely be using it to verify endotracheal tube placement. But for cardiac arrest, one of the suggestions they make is that you can do it to kind of um, measure CPR quality or um, to, to use it as a guide to um, uh, kind of measure the effectiveness of your CPR. And in general, what they say is your um, end tidal CO2 should be greater than 10 during cardiac arrest. But what I'll tell you is in hospitals especially, most of our arrests are um, witnessed. And so your end tidals and what we're seeing clinically is that a lot of times the end tidals are, you know, in the teens, 20s, sometimes up to 30s with good quality CPR. So, um, but, but in general, your end tidal should be above 10. Okay, so let's kind of dig into this. So this, this is what the um, AHA is recommending. Is It's a class one recommendation, which is the highest recommendation to use capnography to verify endotracheal tube placement. If your end tidal is less than 10 after 20 minutes in a resuscitation um, in an intubated patient, this is strongly associated with failure um, to resuscitate. The one patient population, though, I will say, is you have to be careful with that, is if they have a pulmonary embolism. Because if you've got a pulmonary embolism, you're never going to have a good end tidal CO2. So that's one area where you should kind of be careful. And then they recommend that your ventilation breath should be 10 per minute with an advanced airway. So what I want to show you is um, this next case. This is actually one of those CPR report cards that I've shown you guys in previous webinars in our series, um, just showing where um, they've used end tidal CO2, and we were very um, easily able to see, boy, were we overventilating. So what, what's the recommended ventilation rate in a code? It's 10. And so we can see by capnography that we, they were bagging or ventilating at 41, 45, 49, 51. So that's way too fast, and that's going to have a direct impact on your CPR quality. Okay, so Emily, you ready? We're going to do another polling question. Here's what I want to know from you guys. Um, do you use capnography in your facility in cardiac arrest situations? So give me an idea if you guys are using capnography out there. Okay, what Here do people say out there? Oh, wow, this is really exciting because, you know, um, I have to say I've been teaching on capnography for a number of years, and, um, you know, it used to be we'd have single-digit percentage of people who were using capnography, but it looks like more and more people are starting to use it. Okay, All right, so Emily, I think if you can get me back to the slides, um, we can keep going, but 
I, the, the answer of sometimes, but we forget, one of the things I can say about that is one of the key, key, key elements in really making sure that people use capnography doing a cardiac arrest is to have someone be in charge of it, and that is absolutely key. Is someone's got to be responsible for it, because if you don't have anyone in charge, we're going to forget. Okay, so here's another, another case. This is our second case. We have a 54-year-old who collapsed outside of a grocery store in a small town in, um, in Minnesota. Who knows? We might even have someone from Goodhue, Minnesota out there on the line. So, but um, two dozen uh, worker, uh, rescuers, EMS um, and uh, agency, uh, so EMS had worked with the patient, then they airlifted the patient um, to Mayo in Rochester, but they worked on this patient for 96 minutes. What do you guys think about resuscitating someone for 96 minutes. Most of you are probably saying, oh boy, that's a long time. And I, I agree, it is a long time, but the patient had a V-fib arrest. And V-fib, as you guys learned in the previous webinars, is the most resuscitatable. And so why did they keep going for 96 minutes? Well, here's the deal. They kept going for 96 minutes because the end title was reading 37, uh, 32 to 37 the entire time. So basically, the patient was telling um, the, the team that was working on them. I'm here. You are perfusing me. Get me to a cath lab. Open my artery that's occluded that's causing my V-fib. And that's what they did was they took the patient to the cath lab and, um, and they opened the patient's LAD. So they did a thrombectomy and um, stent placement to the LAD. And this is the patient here. You can kind of see in the front row with the blue jacket who's able to tell his story. And so they went 96 minutes. They pushed the box. They kind of thought outside the box and pushed it because his end title told them not to give up. And this is where capnography can be super helpful because there is some thought in hospitals especially that we're giving up too soon on a lot of cardiac arrests. So, so at the end title, average of about 35, told the team not to give up. So, you know, how, you know, does capnography reflect CPR quality? The one thing I will say is the data are somewhat mixed on this. And this was a study that was published last year out of Arizona. And what they did was they looked at 1,581 minutes of capnography data um, where they used side stream technology. And they were able to show that, you know, that indeed when the chest compression depth increased, there was some reflection of that in the end tidal CO2. Um, when the rate increased, there was also some reflection of that in the end tidal CO2, but not as much as you would think. Um, but where really end tidal CO2 was telling was when they overventilated patients and they saw a reflective drop in the end tidal CO2. So we know end tidal CO2 isn't perfect during cardiac arrest as a measure of CPR quality, but it can be helpful. And so, um, you know, anytime you've got really, really low end tidal CO2s, you know, just always ask yourself, A, is the CPR quality adequate and what it should be, but B, you know, do we have a pulmonary embolism here? And so that's one of the questions you should be asking. And so end tidal CO2 is actually a very good predictor of ROSC. And Marv Wayne, who's up in Bellingham, Washington, who's an awesome guy, uh, 20 years ago showed, you know, in a small study that um, that in, out of uh, 13, there were 16 survivors, in 13 of his 16 survivors, end tidal CO2 had a huge um, uh, jump when the patient got ROSC. And so um, they were able to detect an um, increase in the end tidal CO2 far before the point a pulse or blood pressure were palpable. So I think that's quite Telling. So here's our next case. We've got a 38-year-old who's been in PEA arrest for 20 minutes. Um, they think the patient had a um, hypoxic arrest from a drug overdose. And so they got the patient intubated. We're doing um, chest compressions. Capnography is reading 24. So what do you guys think about a 24? That looks pretty darn good, right? So 24. So then someone does an ABG and they come in and they, they you know, during the arrest, they get an ABG and someone comes in and reads the gas and they're like, 7.18, the CO2 is 82. And, um, and so what happened was um, there was a focus on the CO2 of 82 and the code, the team leader said to the respiratory therapist, now mind you, CPR is ongoing, they said to the respiratory, respiratory therapist, 
bag faster. Let's blow off that CO2. And let me ask you, so if you've listened to my other webinars, should we bag faster during intra-arrest? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, if you ventilate faster on this patient, you're going to have a direct impact on your CPR quality in that the intrathoracic chest pressure is going to increase, which is going to have an impact on venous return and a direct impact on your CPR quality. So when is the appropriate time to fix the PaCO2, the appropriate time, is when you get ROSC, or return of spontaneous circulation. So look at this PaCO2 of 82 and the end title of 24. This patient has VQ mismatch. Would you expect that in a cardiac arrest? And the answer is absolutely. In a cardiac arrest, I expect VQ mismatch. So when should I fix that PaCO2 of 82? When I get ROSC. That's when we fix it. Um, you do not fix it when you're doing chest compressions because it's going to really decrease the quality of your chest compression. So, all right, let's keep going with this. Okay, next case, 52-year-old goes into V-fib. So they're doing chest compressions. They're shocking the patient. They give epinephrine. They intubate the patient, and they're giving one breath every six minutes. We've got a catenography of 20. So what do you guys think about 20? Perfect. That's where I want it to be, right? So, so it's 20, and that's exactly where I want it to be. Perfect. So let's keep going with our compressions. All right, so now we get a new provider. Um, so we assess the rhythm. We're still in V-fib. We increase the energy. We shock the patient, and we get a new provider to provide provide chest compressions. Now the one thing I will tell you about this case is the person who started doing compressions was about my height, which is five foot two. And so they I will just say, you know, not the biggest in stature. Okay. So now the catnography is only reading nine. So what do you guys think about nine? It was twenty. Now it's nine. Ah, we should be asking, maybe coaching the person who's giving compressions, and look, I'd be really careful about saying compressing faster. They're probably compressing fast enough, but maybe they need to go deeper and look at their body form and the position in which they're giving compressions. So we give advice and we say compress deeper. Okay, so they try, but the end title is still less than 10, so what should we do? The answer is let's get a new compressor. Somebody else has got to get compressions. This, per this person is not able to do it. So let's get a new provider. Okay, so now we're seven minutes into the arrest. The capnography suddenly goes up to 38. So what do you guys think about 38? It was 20, dropped down to 10, got a new compressor, and then it worked its way up, and now it just suddenly jumped up to 38. So what do you think probably has happened? Likely we have ROS, so likely we've got return of spontaneous circulation. Um, circulation. So go to the end of your two-minute cycle, and we assess, and there is indeed a pulse. So there's a pulse. So, so capnography can be a really good indicator of return of spontaneous circulation. Okay, so during the arrest, who's in the room? Everyone, right? There's like 30 people in the room. You get return of spontaneous circulation. You've got a pulse back. Now who's in the room? It's you and your respiratory therapist. So um, so me and the RT are in the room. And this, I'm noticing the end title is kind of dwindling. Now it's down to 34 or so. So now what this is where um, when you get ROSC, where you should keep the end title hooked up. And I will tell you, my patient's end title went from 34 to 26 very quickly, and it was way before I detected a drop in the blood pressure. So if you see a downward trend in your end tidal CO2, that's a sign that they could be hypoperfused. And so then you've got to ask yourself, you know, does this patient need fluid? Do they need dobutamine? Do they need a vasopressor? They need something because they're not adequately perfused. So, um, so what I ended up doing in this patient was I ended up giving them fluid and um, the end title went from 26 to 32. So what do you guys think about that? That is a good trend, and that's what the patient needed. They needed some fluid. And so what we ended up doing after that was getting an echocardiogram just to look at the left ventricular uh, and function and wall motion of the patient's heart after their cardiac arrest. So so in bottom line, though, um, um, end title CO2 is a recommendation in the, since the 2015, actually since the 2010 guidelines, but, um, but it is a recommendation, and you should definitely continue it uh, when you get return of spontaneous circulation. So, okay, last case. So here we go. This is the last case. So we've got a patient who's a 49-year-old, so 49-year-old female. Now, she had had um, surgery, and she was being treated for a left lower extremity DVT that she developed post-op. So she tells the nurse that um, she feels really short of breath, and she says to the nurse, I feel like I'm going to die. Now, when patients say to you, I feel like I'm going to die, I take it serious, because usually what happens? 
they die. <laughs> and so, and um, so anyway, so this is what happened with her: is she got really short of breath. They activated a rapid response. Um, got a 12 lead. Um, during the rapid response and she had some definite changes on her 12 lead. She had some ST changes in her inferior leads to 3 and AVF but she also developed a new right bundle branch block. So this was a brand new change that we hadn't seen on her ECG um, previously. So then shortly after that she goes into a PEA arrest. So we start chest compressions, call a code. So let me ask you guys. So Emily, you ready for some polling? Yeah. So what I want to know from you guys is what is your differential? What do you think's happening? So she was short of breath. She had a DVT. So you guys can start voting now. So did she have an acute MI with an inferior wall um, involvement? Did she have pulmonary edema? Did she have a pulmonary embolism or did she does she have just really bad pneumonia? So what do you guys think out there? What's your differential? Good. Yeah, so we're going to go back to the slides and I'm going to finish off this case and then I'll take questions from you. But you are totally, completely, 100% right. It was a pulmonary embolism. Okay. So we start resuscitating her, and um, and the, the, we made a decision to give TPA. And so a lot of people, a few people in the code were like, "I don't know about giving TPA. She just had surgery." And it's like, "Well, you guys, we're in cardiac arrest here. She's in arrest. I don't think we can harm her at this point because we were having trouble, um, you know, getting her back." So, so anyway, so we decided to give her combinant TPA. Um, we gave 90 milligrams total. We got her intubated. Um, her end title was reading 8. So should I kick somebody off the chest who's providing chest compressions because the end title is 8? Or do I need to understand that the end title is 8 because I have a big clot in my pulmonary artery? And the answer is probably the latter. Is The reason the um, end title is only 8 is because the patient's got a big pulmonary embolism. And so with, with um, um, pulmonary embolism, you're never going to have a good end title CO2 because there's VQ mismatch. So she's got tons of dead space. So why is it only reading 8? Because she's got a big clot. And so again, she's got VQ mismatch. Match. So, but here's the thing you need to understand is her end title is going to be super low, but what do you all think happened to her PaCO2? And the answer is it's going to get really high. And so this will, again, um, show us evidence of VQ mismatch. So with a pulmonary embolism, there's lots of dead space. And basically dead space is the volume of air um, that doesn't take part in gas exchange. And so, um, so Patients with PEs have a lot, a ton of dead space. And so there's actually a calculation you can do that's called a dead space calculation to um, just to identify, especially if we were able to get ROSC, to identify trends and to see if our TPA is working and if we're improving. But the calculation is your PaCO2 minus your end title divided by your PaCO2. And if this um, is less than 30, then you don't have a PE. It's, it's a 100% negative predictive value. But if it's above 30, it could be indicative of dead space that you would see with a PE. So for this patient, um, we got ROSC with an end title of 11. Okay, so we got the TPA infused. Two hours later, her end title is 15, and her PaCO2 is 56. So does she have mismatch? The answer is absolutely she's got mismatch, but I expect that because she had a PE. So her dead space was 73%. So then we kept the end title hooked up. Her end title, it went from 15 to 24, six hour, or four hours later, and her PaCO2 is 48. So are we heading in the right direction? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Now her dead space is 50%. So 12 hours later, her end title is 30, and her PaCO2 is 40. So we've not quite normalized, but we're almost there, and her dead space is 25%. So bottom line, was the end title CO2 helpful in A, identifying that it was a PE, but also B, in um, identifying if we're heading in the right direction? And the answer is absolutely. And so prognosis, this woman actually did fine. Um, she, and we were, um, she was, you know, made it out of the hospital, um, but that we were able to use the TPA to lyse the clot and um, reestablish perfusion. So, in conclusion, I think capnography is probably the most underutilized, um, you know, non-invasive resource that we've got in the hospital. It is a level one recommendation from the American Heart Association to use for verification of endotracheal tube placement. But 
it can also be helpful to decide, you know, if um, your patient is septic, um, if they're going to be a fluid responder, um, to identify VQ mi matching or mismatching, and then of course um, CPR quality and identifying, you know, if we should terminate resuscitation efforts. So with this, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris Lux, our awesome moderator, and she's going to give you a couple of announcements, but she's also going to take some questions. Thank you, Nicole, for that very informative presentation. I know I learned a lot. I do have a few housekeeping issues to discuss with the audience before we discuss audience questions. As stated previously, this educational program has been approved for one contact hour for both nurses and respiratory therapists by the American Association for Respiratory Care, the California Board of Nursing, and the Florida Board of Nursing. To obtain your continuing education certificate, you will need to go to the website www.saxtesting.com forward slash SL, which is listed on the slide that is on the screen. You will need to register on the test site and complete the evaluation form. Upon successful submission, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. The accreditation statement is disclosed on the slide. The on-demand version will also be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. Nicole, I'm happy to report that we have a lot of interesting questions that the audience has submitted. <laughs> I love it. Okay, let's hear uh, it. All right, you ready? Uh, the I'm first ready. Question is actually from three different people: Leslie, Pam, and Joyce. Okay. Is is there a reliable way to use end tidal CO2 with BiPAP or with non-invasive ventilation with a mask? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so it can be challenging in that patient population, but I will say, yes, you can. Um, I, when I've talked to respiratory therapists about this, and what a lot of them say is they'll use the cannula devices um, with BiPAP. Um, I'm going to be honest, I personally have never done it, um, but I have asked a number of respiratory therapists from centers all over the country, and they say, yes, you can, but they use the cannula device. Great. Um, the next question is from Austin. What is it that causes the downward slope of the capnography that was mentioned in th with asthmatics? I would expect the entire CO2 to increase with prolonged exhalation. Yeah, well, I think, well, it's, so with asthmatics, you usually see that shark fin um, pattern. So so that one is like kind of a weird upward slope, and um, it's, it's caused from the bronchorestriction in the airway. Now, the downward slope in like a severe um, uh, uh, um, COPD patient is a lot of it's from um, uh, basically air trapping. Okay. So there you Thank go. You. Yep. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Laura. Would the use of the passive leg raise test with capnography be appropriate in the medical surgical units to determine appropriate interventions when patients become hypotensive? Yeah, okay, I think that's an awesome question. So, so most of the studies out there right now, I will tell you, um, are using capnography with an intubated patient. However, I, I'll tell you, we've done it in non-intubated patients, and it does seem to be um, to be reflective. Um, I'll just say the data are somewhat sparse on that right now. I'm hoping that's kind of where we go in the future, but um, is it probably better than guessing? And the answer is likely. Um, I, I, you know, I think um, we ha we have to stop guessing on fluids in, um, you know, in sepsis. We've got to get the fluids right because when we over um, resuscitate patients with fluids, there are so many long-term issues and organ ischemia. Uh, um, organ failure, patients going to ARDS. Um, so, but but I think um, even if you're not using capnography as a facility, um, you should be looking at some sort of a non-invasive stroke volume measure. And um, Emily, I will say there are a few. Um, devices out on the market that I would highly recommend. So I think, um, you know, the data aren't just quite there yet with capnography. I think there might be um, hope of it in the future, but I think your facility and all facilities out there should be looking at some sort of a non-invasive stroke volume measure. Um, Nicole, the next question is from Connie. If end tidal CO2 does not go up with the passive leg raise, is that a good indicator to use pressors? Yes, it's exactly what you should do. Yeah, yeah. So if the end title doesn't go up, and you're trying to decide fluid presser, fluid presser, which way do I go? 
go to a presser at that point. And actually, that case that I showed you guys, um, and I know, like, I am so sorry, I jam packed this session with tons of info. But, um, but um, what I, what happened in that patient that I showed you, where I did the passive leg raise, later that shift, she got hypotensive again, and I was like, oh, I don't want to give her more fluid if I don't have to. So what I did was I did a passive leg raise again, and her end title baseline was 34. I lifted her legs, and it stayed at 34. So what do you guys all out there think I restarted on her? The answer is I restarted norepinephrine. So there you go. All right, the next question comes from Kathy. Do you even suggest entitled CO2 on pediatric patients with uncuffed trachs during CPR? Oh, I don't know. Oh, uncuffed trach during CPR. You know, I don't know. I'd ha I, I'm just going to be honest. I'm not going to make something up. I don't know on that one. I'd have to look it up. Okay. I would, I, would, I would say ask their respiratory therapist or their pulmonologist and see what they say about that one. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Sylvia. If a patient has severe COPD and is a retainer, can you still use end tidal CO2 for accuracy? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely still use end tidal CO2, and what the way we use it is, you know, trending. So, you know, are they trending upward? Are they retaining? And I think it's especially um, helpful to use um, when you've got somebody who is ventilated and you're trying to get them off the ventilator. So just so you guys know, the new te term is that we don't wean patients from the ventilator, we liberate them from the ventilator. And so if you're trying to liberate, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is for, for real. <laughs> so anyway, Society of Critical Care Medicine, thank you. Um, but if you're trying to extubate, you know, get a patient extubated, um, definitely, I mean, you can use end tidal CO2. And if you're seeing their end tidal uh, kind of going an upward trend, then that's a sign, you know, that they might be struggling. And so I think it's very helpful. Okay. The next question, Nicole, is from William. Is there any difference in accuracy between side or mainstream devices? Oh, yeah. So mainstream is kind of where everyone's going now. And, um, yeah, so the sample size from mainstream is a lot smaller. Um, uh, a couple other things is I know with side stream we had issues with you know filters getting clogged a lot or a condensation lines was very common um, but mainstream is kind of the newer more updated form of um, cat of a kind of sampling that we're using now so yes definitely mainstream is where everyone's going now all right so this will be um, the last question this is from Catherine do you think end tidal CO2 monitoring can help differentiate between acute coronary syndrome MI and PE in the cath lab? Oh, ugh, not no. I'm going to say no on that one. Um, no, no, I don't think so. So with an acute coronary syndrome, okay, well, okay, I kind of see where she's going with it though. Okay, so I guess. Poss let me. Add, oh, now I'm all over the place. Okay, so let me say this. Possibly. So. Would I use it as the only differentiator? I mean, really, being in the cath lab and cathing the patient is what's going to kind of help differentiate whether you've got, you know, a, a lesion in your a coronary artery versus uh, the pulmonary artery. You will get big VQ mismatch with a PE, but here's the thing. If your patient's in cardiogenic shock because they've got a thrombus in their coronary artery, you could also get VQ mismatch from that. So should it be used as a dif differentiator for a PE versus a, a, a clot in your artery? Uh, uh, coronary artery, I'd say no, um, because both conditions you're going to have VQ mismatch. But if you've got someone who has got a who's arresting and they've got a very 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 low end tidal, that's where you can kind of ask the question of do we think this is a PE, and it can almost help to be diagnostic. But I don't think I would use it to say my patient's got a STEMI or they've got a PE. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for all the very interesting questions you've submitted, but unfortunately, our time is up. It has been a pleasure to be your moderator for the webinar, and as always, Nicole, I've learned a lot from your presentation, and I hope our audience has too. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, I learned a lot as well, and I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Nicole, for this very informative presentation, and as well to you, Christine, for being our moderator today. It's been such a pleasure working with both of you, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests, in the live audience today, and as well, those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now, this does conclude our session for today. Today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.